You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. chasers of light to the purveyors of pictures to all of you listening this is the f11 photography podcast i am your host kevin deal along with your co-host one brandon gory hey how we doing folks it's good to be here great to be here Yes, we are uh, here on this uh, cloudy, overcast day in Austin, Texas, broadcasting, uh, not live, recorded, and delayed, from the Austin School of Film, Cinemaker Space, here in Austin, Texas. I've got a shoot later today, but we decided we were going to knock out some uh, episodes. We do these episodes in clusters, and we have a sponsor. Our sponsor is Luminar Neo, which is AI software. Uh, really cool software that you can use as both a standalone software or as a plugin in uh, software like Photoshop, and that's how I use it. But Brandon has been testing it out quite a bit, and I want him to talk a little bit about what he likes about Luminar Neo. Yeah, I was really excited to get Luminar Neo on, um, you know, on the color grading space and on the color editing space. Obviously, that's what it is. I use it as a standalone system, and some of the cool features that really stood out to me is. Well, first and foremost, it's AI based. So the technology, it looks at your photo and it's able to discern really well your subject from your background. And so it has uh, a couple key things that really stood out to me that I've really been uh, using to help increase um, efficiency with my workflow. One of those being is um, there's, there's a tool that brightens the face of a model and pretty well. So if, if you're having trouble balancing the light on your on your backdrop versus on your model or you want your model to stand out without like super vignetting the image, the facial lighting system is really great on there as well as there's something really nifty that they brought to the forefront of photo editing with AI is they have a tiered contrast system. Now, instead of pushing your curves layer to the max and trying to change the dynamic range of your photo by, by manually adjusting a curves layer, which they also have, what you can do is they have uh, contrast sliders in the highlight range, the mid-tone range, and the shadow range. So if you're kind of trying to control the, uh, the fall off of shadows and lights to a very uh, fine-tuned and peculiar level, um, Luminar Neo does that exceptionally well. They also have a really cool balanced uh, color grading science for your highlights, midtones, and shadows. And they also give you a lot of control with their HSL uh, slides and everything like that. And there's a lot you can do with Luminar that it just it 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 decreases your workflow and it it makes editing that much smoother. We're always looking to save time because time is money. Check out the link. In the description below for 10% off uh, your copy of Luminar, you can either get it as a perpetual license or you can get it in a monthly subscription. And I too have been testing it out and uh, the uh, face, uh, lightening up the face, uh, that feature that Brandon was talking about, I tried that out in the studio session yesterday where I had a super bright white backdrop and I just kept looking at the subject's face and I was like, I guess I didn't light it up enough. I used that module, it lit it up exactly where I was looking to get it to. And so definitely highly recommend it. Check out our affiliate link in the description below. But today's episode, we're going to talk about something that I know Brandon loves to talk about and I like to talk about, and that is editing. Today is the editing episode. We're going to talk about all things editing. We're going to talk about culling. We're going to talk about color grading. We're going to talk about a lot of really cool things that we do. Uh, how do we start an edit? When do we start an edit? How much time do we let pass before we really dig into an edit? When to edit in black and white and color? What vibe do you need as far as uh, how your room is lit up, the music you listen to, etc. So we're going to talk about First, our workflow for editing. I'll start first so Brandon can listen and react. The way, Thank you. I, yeah, no problem. So, 
first and foremost, it depends on what I am shooting. So I mainly shoot models, I mainly shoot portraits, but I do shoot the occasional wedding. And those clients want stuff turned around right away. So, uh, and so does pretty much everybody else. They, they want things as quickly as possible. So the way I attack uh, my shoots is I go and I do my shoot. And then when my shoot is over that night, when I get home and I have all the stuff uh, unloaded off my card and put onto my iMac, I then decide that I want to just do one or two edits that night. And then I usually put it in my Instagram story. It's for me to establish a vibe of the shoot. I just want to like document, okay, this is the vibe I was going for. This is where my mentality was at on this day. And then I sleep on it. And then the next day uh, I'll usually go back and I'll look. And if I feel like it, it, it's time to start editing, I will start editing. Um, you know, we had an episode that we did earlier where we talked about things to improve your photography. And one of the uh, subjects we talked about was taking time away from your photos because you get emotionally attached to things that you put a lot of work into and it may still end up being mediocre. Uh, I also feel that way with edits. Sometimes I just need to step back from my edit and when I am ready I will then begin the process of editing. I also feel that way about culling photos. You know, a lot of times uh, you're not, you have you take the same shot three times. Well, get rid of one, right? And then there's stuff like obviously if someone's uh, eyes are closed or they're making a weird face or they're in between, you know, expressions. You can delete that stuff. But I tend to usually like let a day or two pass before I really start digging into my edits. Uh, but as far as how I cull. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of look at it like if it's a portrait session in a studio and there's no real story behind it, we're just like taking pictures of somebody. I just find like variations of different poses and then I kind of narrow it down and I just get rid of like what I consider to be duplicates or redundant files. Um, and then I, I narrow it down because as we mentioned in a previous episode, our clients are typically bad at choosing photos. So Take, take that away from them and do it for them. Uh, and then if you do give them uh, photos, create the illusion that they're in control and only give them photos you want them to choose. <laughs> and then they choose it and then they, they're like, wow, you added value to this shoot even though you're really just manipulating me. So, <laughs> But <laughs> just pro tip, that is how I call a session where there's no real story behind it. When I'm telling a story, I then call things and I try to put them in a linear order to tell a story. And uh, so I will, I will, you know, maybe one part of the story I, I take a lot more better pictures of. Uh, and then the other part, I may only have one or two good pictures. I still make sure that I, I call it down to where uh, I have a cohesive story. And if I don't have a cohesive story, then I have to kind of like dig in and maybe try to find a different part of the story that I can make sound like the part of the story that I screwed up. Um, and so that's how I call my photos down. Um, but what is your, what is your process like? Cause we're just going to focus on when you finish a session and how much time elapses. And when you start calling, we're just taking it from that point uh, that, to, to this point, we're not taking it beyond that. We'll get to that later in the episode. So what's your process when you finish a session uh, and when you begin calling and all that? So when I finish a shoot, um, I usually like to come home. I like to get all my photos off the SD card because I don't want to have to worry about, oh, can I format, format my card? Um, I take them all off. I make a folder in my 2023 uh, folder in my, my hard drive. And there I, I leave the, the model's name. If it's a second shoot in, in the year, then obviously I, I change the name to like an 01 or I'll change it to the idea of the concept. If there is an idea of the concept, and then I'll just put all those folders in, or all those uh, photos in a raw folder. That's the first thing I do. And then I usually I'll wait at least a day to even come back to them and look at them because there's, there's a multitude of different shoot ideas and uh, shoot and processes in your head. There's the one before the shoot. There's the one you visualize during the shoot. And then there's the one that comes into play during the editing. And so very seldom are those all concise or cohesive. They usually are if it's if other brands are involved or there's multiple parties involved where the, the sole conception isn't entirely mine. Um, and so I'll leave it a day. Um, I'll let those sit a day because I don't want... I don't want the vision that I had during the shoot when a lot of things are changing to bleed into what I see editing. So I need to give my eyes a rest. I need to give my idea of what the shoot is a rest and look at it with a, a, a fresh idea um, at least a day later. 
and then that's when I'll begin my culling. And with the culling, it's I'll, I'll have the idea of what the shoot was and its intention in the back of my head, but I oftentimes don't let it get in the way of me seeing what a truly good image is and um, what I want for the shoot. So um, I try to take it down as much as possible in culling. And then when I, after culling those photos, I, I export all of them to a final selection. And um, so I'll have them sitting, sitting in a selection folder, which I will then later on bring into my editing softwares of choice. It's interesting you mentioned that because when I was in Lightroom, I used the exact same way of labeling things that you did. When I switched over to Capture One, I changed it. The way I do things now is that I uh, will have 2023, and then like let's say I do a shoot on January 1st of 2023, in my 2023 folder, I will have a 2023.01.01 space, the model's name or the shoot name. And then I, I, I number it all like that, so everything's in chronological order instead of alphabetical order. And I found that that's uh, been more compatible with how things work in Capture One. I named the session the same thing, obviously, as the folder. And uh, yeah, that's just that's just how I've, I've kind of changed things up. And then if it's, I'm working with a brand, I'll make it the brand name instead of the model name. Uh, but that's, that's how I, I, I've been doing things, and it seems to keep me organized. And uh, I, I seem to be able to remember what month I did a shoot in the year that way because I'm constantly looking at it. And so, like, when someone's like, hey, can you do a re-edit of this thing that we did? And I don't remember when it happened. I was like, I know it happened in September. And then I'll go back to September of 2021 and I'll find it. And uh, so, yeah, just, I just thought that was interesting that I used to be in Lightroom and you're in Lightroom. And I used to label things exactly the same way that you are currently labeling things when I used to use Lightroom. So... You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. What is your workflow when you start an edit? Because mine is I usually go through and I will find certain sections of a shoot. So it's like, oh, yeah, there's this one look that we did in this one location and this one look we did in this other location. And I'll like do an edit of each location and each look. And then I'll be like, okay, I'm establishing my vibe. And from here, I'll move on. Uh, you know, and then I, it's like, it, it builds, I do it, I, I edit in segments and then I'm like, okay, cool. And I, I, I wait and I go back and I look, I'm like, yes, I still like it. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to dive into this editing style now because I'm not a preset photographer. I do use presets from time to time. Like when I shoot weddings, I absolutely use presets because it's like, that's, that's the vibe of a wedding nowadays is they just want presets. They want everything to look cookie cutter. So I just, you know, do use the presets, make my slight adjustments and then collect my paycheck. But when I'm doing personal work, you know, I want modeling agencies to like take note of and working with agency models. I, I, I have to be very like, I have to get really in depth with this stuff and make it my own and put my own stamp on it. And so, uh, I wasn't sure where I was going with that, but other than the fact that I do, you know, I have to get more intense with my, my edits. So I take more time and then I'm more nuanced with it. That's what I was going for is I, I'm a little bit more nuanced with it. Um, and then I build it and I build it and I build it. And then I f finally, when I feel like I hit my stride on a couple of edits that then kind of establishes where I'm going to take my shoots, uh, in post-production. Now I will say that over the years, um, I have been editing less and less and putting more emphasis on getting everything as correct on the camera as possible. That's the way I've always been coming up on film. And so I find that uh, when I compare what I do to what other people do, I'm usually far less heavy handed in editing than they are. Um, and I, I just, you know, that's one of the reasons, maybe that's just the gearhead in me. That's why I own so many different camera systems is because it's like, I have this aesthetic I want to go to rather than shooting it on one camera system and one camera system only, and then trying to make that aesthetic come out and post, I'd rather just switch my camera to a different camera that hits that aesthetic for me based off of the way that the color science is in the color and the camera or the film stock or whatever. And then I don't have to do as much work in post-production. That's how I've kind of evolved over the years. And some of that has to do with the fact that, you know, when I was younger, I couldn't afford to do that. And now I can afford to have multiple camera systems to do that. So it, it, that, that is absolutely a luxury that I have at this point in time. But back to it, though, I like to, when in the post-production side of things, though, is I do like to uh, build and build and build. And then I find that there's like this threshold that once I punch through, I, I finally like have this clear direction of where I'm going to take things. And then that's when I will just 
just all day long, just go hardcore on edits for this one project. So how does your process work uh, when you do edits in that respect? Well, yeah. So on the preset thing, it's, um, I got into presets not too long ago on uh, Lightroom Classic and I thought, oh my God, because I'd never used them before. And I, and I love their, um, their RGB uh, uh, color grading signs there because it helped me harmonize colors to a more cinematic grade, you know, and it, it helped balance uh, my colors across the color wheel because uh, I shoot on an extremely flat profile on Nikon. So that affords me the luxury of, I don't have to deal with colors that don't get in the way. So if, if I did want to harmonize the colors and bring them out and saturate them, then I would use uh, Lightroom to sort of balance those colors out. And I've since started moving away from that because at the end of the day, you know, you can have a, harm, a harmonized photo and like, uh, it, you know, you, it, the whole thing can be cool. The whole thing can be this, that, the other. Um, and I think that's a technicality. I think I was getting lost in the technicality of what a photo, what I thought a photo should be versus what I want out of a photo. And so moving towards what I want out of a photo, it really, it really is, I divide it by section. So if we've got multiple outfits, multiple different lighting scenarios, and um, multiple makeup looks, I'll divide those into their, eat, like into their own mood. Um, and usually just by virtue of how I shoot, those will all be different shades of a larger umbrella mood of what the, you know, the concept of the shoot is. And so like you, I do spend time, uh, dicking around with, you know, what, what looks good with this shot. You know, I know I intended this shoot to be cooler. I know I intended it to be, um, a flatter lighting and, and more harmonious from subject to backdrop. And so, uh, with that said, I'll just, I'll play devil's advocate. I'll be like, all right, well, what does it like look like if it's warmer? You know, what does it look like if the skin's desaturated and I harmonize the clothes with the, with the backdrop and kind of do that? What does it look like if, you know, her lips aren't as red as they should be and everything's sort of just in the, in the brown and white space, you know what I mean? Or the light blue and white space or something like that. And so you, I trust my, my eyes to know what looks good instead of um, trying to characterize myself against what I, th what I think should look good. And so it really just comes down to um, picking an edit for the section of the shoot that I'm in and just going hard with it. Um, and depending on what that shoot is, that will tell me how much or how little I edit because I can take an image that is flat and sometimes I'll just be like, you know what, the coarseness of the edit when I punch a contrast into what shouldn't have been a contrasted image, um, it speaks for itself in the vibe and it, it, I think it communicates more with what I was trying to say with the shoot than, uh, just strictly out of camera. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, like presets in general, though, I, you know, back when I first got Lightroom, I used to use them all the time just because like, oh, there's all these different like places that give me great ideas to edit. But what I noticed over time, and one of the reasons I've moved away from presets, it's not just establishing your own identity as an editor and as a photographer and, you know, having people go, oh, that's one of your shots because you edit it a certain way. It's the fact that presets are very unpredictable because cameras are unpredictable. You think about the nature, like some camera systems lean more magenta and others lean more green. And when I'm making a, um, when I'm making a preset, how do I know what the person's going to be using? You know, like when I use Canon RF lenses, their L lenses, they are very contrasty. They have a lot of contrast to them. And then my Fuji GFX lenses are more surgical. And, uh, my, my, X series lenses are different than the other two. So like they all kind of see differently. So if I'm applying the pre preset to some, to three different ways of seeing, it's going to look three different ways. So it's not, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily put you in a good position. Like, I mean, it can get you kind of closer to something. So if you're like, Hey, I want a matte look, a black matte white, a, a, a matte black and white look. And there's this matte black and white preset. Sure. It can get you kind of a little closer but you can also just learn that, hey, if I take my black point and move it around, I can make anything matte in like a second flat or I fuck with the contrast a little bit. I can make something look pretty matte pretty quickly. So, you know, I find that uh, while 
using that matte black and white preset may make the black and whites look matte. It may cause problems in the highlights and all these other things that I didn't intend to happen. And so I've just noticed over time that like, well, you know, using presets, like it may solve one problem, but then create more problems as opposed to just going, I want it to be a matte black and white look. Okay. I know to take my black point and move it. And now I've got the matte thing, but I liked the way everything else was, you know, whereas the preset ruins it. And, and so and then at the end of the day, it's also your photo from start to finish. You know, it's like, I took this photo, I brought it in, I edited the whole thing from front to back and then I delivered it to the client and I knew I had control over it at every point. And so you know, there's something to be said for that, in my opinion, uh, as far as, um, you know, edits are concerned, but I still do use, uh, presets every now and then. Like I have presets I've created, uh, starting points. I have, um, very, like, sometimes I want my black and white to look really bad when, on purpose. When, when you say presets, are you talking about other people's presets? Cause I, I would never, not once, like these are all my own, uh, yeah, so I mean, I am talking about other people's presets uh, as starting points is what I used to do a long time ago. I now, every now and then, use my own presets that I've created as starting points because I have some signature looks I've created over the years. Um, some black, mainly black and white. I don't really like to create color presets because I find that there's just way too much shift going on. And even my own presets, it's like that's not what I was going for. And so, uh, but with black and white, I have a lot of black and white presets I've made of my own. I, I have a black and white preset on Lightroom Classic, and it's called Paul Newman's Turtleneck, and it's one of my favorite black and white presets. It works with everything. Funny, I have one, and the models love this one. I call it Calvin Klein because it's my 1990s Calvin Klein look when I grew up watching Kate Moss and all these other models. I sat there and just dicked around with that look, and I shoot tethered in Capture One with a Calvin Klein preset on, and the models see themselves on the TV, and they look like a Calvin Klein ad, and they get super confident with it. So then it's, that's the other thing. It's not just editing with presets. It's shooting with presets. That's my favorite thing about uh, shooting tethered. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, I'm very much, I want to see in my camera as close to the final result as possible. So if I'm shooting, uh, if I know I'm going to be doing something in monochrome, I shoot in monochrome. I have monochrome presets on my cameras. I shoot in monochrome because I know that's what my end result is going to look like. I don't even want the model to see the back of my camera in color because I want this to be a black and white shoot. And I don't even want to open up the conversation of, well, I really liked the color. It's like, no, that's not, that's not what we're doing. So, uh, but Speaking of uh, black and white in color, when do you know, do you have a way to, uh, to, to, to put into words? Because I don't think I do. When should something be black and white and when should something be color? <laughs> God damn it. Great question, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's a tricky one. Um, okay, so let's, let's just throw out the window like, there are definitely shoots that I just see it in black and white from start to finish. And that's, you know, obviously I'll know. Um, but in terms of shooting in color and like, how can I decide between doing color and black and white? Um, I used to, and I no longer do this because I think it's, it's weak and it's, it's a weakness as a photographer, but I used to send everyone uh, black and white copies of, of color shoots because I usually preferred the black and white and they preferred the color. And then I just, you know, came to believe that like, okay, you know, like this is just, this is just indecision, you know, am I, which one is the photo? Because when you send two versions, it, it, it shows, uh, indecision in your own work and it shows that, uh, you don't know what the, the look should be. And so it becomes a more subjective, like, it's almost like they're not getting your work. They're just getting, you know, one or the other two shades of the whole, which there is no whole. Um, but that's. In terms of selecting whether it should be black or white or not, it's it's what I'm trying to say. So if 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 the shoot is very shadow heavy and I'm using the shadows uh, to my advantage and the makeup isn't colorful, you know, because if you have an MUA on the set and you've got a makeup designer, even if it's your own shoot, you don't want to shoot all their stuff in black and white because the purpose was the color. If you go into a shoot purposefully harmonizing the style, the look, and the, the makeup and the backdrop and the environment with um, with colors, that you don't want to make it black and white. Um, even even if you do prefer it in black and white, you know you can make your own exceptions for yourself. But generally, you want to be a good enough photographer to execute that shoot. Um, and make it look phenomenal. Even, like you want, if you plan a colored shoot, 
you have to have the professionalism and the the tools necessary to make it look better uh, as color than black and white because you will always be able to fall back on black and white. But in terms of being able to decide, I think it's a gut feeling. Sometimes you're just going through an edit and you just go to that saturation slider and go shoop. And sometimes when it's a color image, you just go, oh, okay, there it is. I can't put it into words. I mean, part of the reason why I feel like we are photographers is because we are visual storytellers. You know, if we were writers, we'd write, but we don't write on paper. We, we take photographs, right? And that's what we do. And a lot of times uh, models will ask me, why did you want to work with me? And it's like, I can't really put it into words. I just saw your look and decided I needed to capture it for a particular project. Just take it as a compliment. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't say I didn't want to work with you. I said, I did want to work with you. So, uh, I, that, that I run into that all the time. And, uh, you know, I guess I'm not going to get too, too like into the weeds on this, but like, it's, it, it is a gut feeling. Uh, I, when I shoot in black and white, first of all, as we've discussed in previous episodes, a lot of times when I test with the model for the first time, if we're just going to go out downtown and just, I'm, sh I'm learning how they shoot. I tend to want to shoot in black and white in those situations because I am trying to just take my work down to light and shadows. And that's all monochrome is. There's no color. There's no distractions. I am taking them down to their raw core as a subject, as a model. And I am trying to figure out how they photograph. I'm trying to figure out like when they turn their head a certain way, I see a certain thing that I'm looking for that maybe color might distract me from seeing. And, and so I try to get to kind of their, their soul, right? Their eyes and, and things like that. And I find that uh, a monochrome strips all that away and it, and it just helps me uh, uh, figure out a little bit more about the rawness of the subject. I have a, a section on my website that I do now called uh, Souls and Monochrome. And it's this, this series I'm doing now. So like models get their digitals done and it's like, Hey, I cut my hair. Here's where I'm at as a model. I'm getting my digitals done and I'm sending them in for like a agency or a client or whatever to hire me. That's what it's for, to market me. I'm kind of do the same thing, but not really. So it's like, it's, it's kind of an updated digital for them, but it's really just an updated black and white shot that I do for them in the series. As we grow our relationships together as a photographer and model, and we work with each other more and more and more. I'm like, Hey, I kind of feel like that we've worked together X amount of times and we're kind of at this different place. I want to update your monochrome shot and that's going to be your new kind of digital that I keep on my my website, your new Souls and Monochrome volume, whatever series that I, I have of you. But anyway, that's 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 why that's where I come from with black and white. And a lot of times when I tell stories, I want to minimize the amount of distractions and focus just on the subject, the model. And I will elect to shoot in black and white in those situations because I feel like it just cuts right down to it and gets me into the story and it focuses the the the, the viewer more on the story. Uh, for the most part. I, you know, I think it would be very fair to say, because you and I, I think you in your own way and me in my own way, we shoot um, with a mental black and white like composition inherently. We separate our subjects using light inherently. We don't have, like very seldom do we ever shoot a subject where they'd be separated by color. You know, for me, that's risky. And it's also just, I just think it's in bad taste for my own reasons. But whether it be focal, um, focal length separation, whether it be geometrical separation, whether it be like leading lines away or to the subject or just simply, um, you know, the, the shadows, uh, we just shoot very geometrically and um, with a lot of composition in mind. And so oftentimes every photo I shoot is viable. It, it is viable in black and white and not only color. I do see things the way you see them geometrically and all that. And I do see things a lot in black and white. Sometimes I will, uh, even if a shoot is intended to be shot in color, I will sometimes still shoot it in black and white. So I did a shoot yesterday in my studio um, for a makeup artist. The point of the shoot was a makeup artist said, hey, I want to work with you. And I don't shoot beauty that often, but I, I like to shoot beauty when I can. And so I was like, oh, yeah, I love an opportunity to shoot beauty. And I did a really cool shoot on my GFX with these old vintage lenses and stuff. And we got to this point where we were doing Paramount lighting. And for those of you who don't know what Paramount lighting is, you can Google it. But basically Paramount Studios for pretty much every actress in like the, the 40s, Greta Garbo, you know, Judy Garland, all these people, uh, Betty Grable, all these actresses that you'd see, they'd shoot them from above and they'd put a little butterfly uh, uh 
shadow under their nose. And the whole point of paramount lighting is you use hard light and you blow out the highlights. It's supposed to blow out the highlights. It's not meant to pull the highlights back and maintain all the detail. And most of the shots of paramount lighting I've seen are shot in black and white. So even though we were trying to show off the makeup, I shot all the shots in black and white and I'll convert them back to color for the, the makeup artist. But I wanted to make sure I nailed the paramount lighting and my brain sees paramount lighting in black and white. And so that's what I did for that uh, yesterday. But I, I fully intend to convert them back over to color because that's what the makeup artist wants to see. Uh, and and she, she, she needed some updated portfolio work and I needed some updated beauty work. This is Jason Berkman and you're listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. We got to talk about and shift gears to vibe. So my studio... I'll tell you about how my studio is set up. And, you know, you, if you really want to know about my vibe, uh, you can go to the link in the description below of this episode and you can check out my YouTube channel. And I talk to the camera all the time and you can just like look over my shoulder and that's my editing vibe. But I have the Godox GL60 tube lights all around my studio to just kind of give me some lighting vibe. I make sure that they don't interfere with my monitor. Uh, but I have them up, have them going. Uh, and then I have my playlists. So... Uh, I will I will now disclose what I usually will listen to uh, when I'm editing. Um, as I said in our very first episode, music drives me as a human being, and it drives my editing. And so it shifts based off of the vibe of the shoot. It, it, it will usually vary from like uh, drum and bass to Tool to Radiohead to Boards of Canada, especially if I have some good organic vibes. I love Boards of Canada. Sometimes if I need to get super technical, I'll listen to like more of the obscure Warp Records stuff like Aphex Twin, Square Pusher, Autechre, Plaid. Um, and I don't really listen to a lot of like old school rock these days when I edit. I don't, uh, the vibe is still, maybe a little Jimi Hendrix, but I don't really listen to a lot of classical music, classic rock, I should say. I, I Classical music and jazz, I can get into that sometimes, but I mainly keep it on the electronic. And then uh, if I'm listening to like heavier uh, metal type music, it's more of the cerebral, cerebral tool type stuff. And um, I find that that works with my vibe. Uh, hope, thankfully, a Apple has their algorithms, and they've, they have a, a, a Kevin Deal station now that they suggest. And when I click on it, a lot of times they get my vibe right. So sometimes I'll just put it on my random station, uh, like Pandora has been doing for years, and Spotify does as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's what I do. I get into a groove. Uh, you know, if my kids or my my new puppy bug me, I just gotta take a break. But uh, that's that's my vibe. I usually try to edit when people are asleep or when people are at school. I, I just need my spot where I can just get in my groove. Uh, I use a stylus pen uh, from Huey Huey I think is the name of the company. Uh, a lot of people use the Wacom tablets, which are great. But I found that for thirty dollars, you can get a really cool uh, a Huey on tablet and a stylus. And it gets me going. And if you're listening to this and you edit with a mouse, stop, get $30, go on Amazon and get a tablet. It will change your life, especially if you retouch skin because you will get carpal tunnel trying to do micro dodge and burn clone stamping on someone's face. I literally have that right now. My The, the tendon in my thumb is actually like tender and raw and I've had my, I've had it in a brace for more than a month. And, you know, cause I go, I go to the gym and so I, I wrap my thumb around a lot of bars and it's, it's not getting better. So that's great advice. So you, you edit with a mouse? I, I do. Fuck dude. Like it's, <laughs> it's not even, and burning. <laughs> it's not even about the, the, the strain it will do to your hands. It's about the, how quickly you can do it. Like, so for $30, I'll give you a link to this and I'll, I'll put a link in the description below, uh, because I have an Amazon affiliates link so I can get a commission check. If you all follow my link below, I'll probably get like 20 cents, but Hey, why not? Um, but it's a Huey on tablet. It's like 30, $40 and it has like a little 40 ergonomic, like 40 degree stand. You put it on there, you put it right in front of your mouse. You have a little uh, stylus pen with a holder on there, and you just pick it up, and you just move it on. And, and the, on the, on the pen, that there's a little uh, clicker, and it, it's your right click. So, if you need to right click something in Photoshop or whatever, you know, right click something in Lightroom to round trip it to Photoshop because I know you use Lightroom, not for long, but you will be you use Lightroom currently. I I use I predominantly I use Photoshop. Lightroom is just the preliminary edits. Yeah, well. 
the the reason I mean, I would be very heavy handed in Photoshop uh, when I was in Lightroom because I didn't really like the modules. But as a raw editor, Capture One, like I don't do color grading in Photoshop. I do it all in in Capture One because they're color they're color grading modules. They have a they have a a, a section just on skin color. Like you, they have a module just for skin color, and it's so so amazing how how in depth you can get with it. Uh, but uh, back to the the stylus pen, like somebody told me, he was like, no, 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 just go buy a stylus pen, and I did it, and it has absolutely made me a way better, way more efficient editor. I have so much more time in my day now. I don't have carpal tunnel, uh, and I, I was starting to get up. That's why I I asked. I was like, man, what are you guys using? And like, wait, you, the guy was like, wait, you do skin editing and you don't use a stylus? What the fuck is wrong with you? And I was like, I don't know any better. And then I, I got one and I was like, oh my God, how did I edit before I did this? Like, it was like, you know, we talk about um, in the gear episode, like gear that, uh, you know, is frivolous and all that. Well, we should do an episode on gear you cannot live without. And a stylus pen, if you edit skin, it is it should be like the, besides calibrating the colors on your screen, the next purchase you should get is a stylus pen straight up. I mean, like it'll change your life. Uh, a frivolous purchase for me was the, I have like this little, um, I have, we'll, we'll do a whole episode on, I think we're going to do a whole episode on things that were hyped that we bought that we later found out was a bunch of bullshit. I want to do that as an episode. Mark that down. Yeah. I can just go back and listen to this. I have the mark in the episode. So, uh, but what do you listen to? When you when you when you when you are working on your edits, what music do you like to listen to? Ooh, man, this is one of my favorite favorite things to talk about. Man, music is such a like you said a driving fucking force. Excuse my French. No excuse necessary. <laughs> okay, all right, here we go. So a lot of, a lot of, it depends on the style, right? Like you said, the style drives the genre. So it, a lot of what I shoot is surrounding the underground experimental artistic genres in, in cinema, in music videos, in music, in cult fashion styles of the nineties and early two thousands. It's huge. And I know I'm not alone in this. So if I am editing anything in that space, Man, I'm listening to Jungle. I'm listening to Liquid DMB. I'm listening to... to Hit the selector! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 no, completely. Um, I'm, listening to, I'm listening to LB, um, LTJ Bookum, you know, I'm, I'm listening to, I'm listening to other, other, you know, DMB artists I can't even possibly think of right now. I'm listening to, um, oh God, what's Metalheads. I'm listening to the Metalheads label. You know what I mean? I got to interrupt you a second. I met LTJ Bookum when he came to Austin in like 2003 <sighs> and, uh, I handed him my demo and I shook his hand in the bathroom I was like, hey, here's my demo, man. He's like, did you wash your hands? <laughs> I shook his hand. And I lied, and I said, of course. And I fucking didn't. Dude, I took... Uh, Oops, I, sorry, Danny, if you're listening. I took a disposable camera to a uh, to a Goldie show when I was 18, and I'm there in my Doc Martens at this, you know, this this little underground club in Austin, Texas. And, oh, man, it, it used to be... Plush. Like, yeah, no, it, no, it wasn't... Pl no, he's too big for that. He's Kingdom. is a 300-person venue. Oh, yeah, I saw Kingdom. I saw... Uh, I saw Qbert spin there in 2014 at yeah. South by Southwest. Go on. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's drum and bass. Um, if it's a more cerebral shoot where I know there's going to be a lot of working on the details, I can't have stuff distracting me. So we go into dub techno, we go into more minimal. Um, I'll put on some UK garage. I'll put on some Detroit or some Chicago house. I'll put on, you know, anything, anything super minimal. Um, a lot of guys come through here under a record label called UBU from across the world. A lot of minimal guys like Andre, uh, Andre Pushkarev, um, Pushkarev, um, Robert, Roger Garrison, and just really minimal artists. And so I'll put that on and just get lost in the void for hours. It's funny you mentioned that. I actually, uh, I, f I forgot to mention that actually is, uh, I listen to Detroit techno a lot when I want to get into, uh, a really technical groove because techno is so deliberate. Like house, house music, it's more like you have the piano stabs and all that, and it has a little bit more organic nature to it. Techno had a bad childhood. Techno's like, 
beat da 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 and then like like i need to be like really and that's why i listen to like autecker as well or at least early autecker they're they're anything post 2003 is like fucking weird but it's it's too disjointed to edit to but i'll listen to like 90s autecker and like i need it to be very concentrated very repetitive and it because like especially when i'm like skin editing and i'm like going pour to pour i'm like i need to be in this fucking groove nobody bug me yes. <laughs> and, and so detroit techno is actually like i have a, a playlist uh apple has a techno playlist and i've been growing this playlist over like five years because every month apple has their techno channel their techno playlist and they put new songs in every month and so i go check in on it and i listen to it and i'm just like right click put in so i have a, I have a playlist called good techno and it's massive it's a five-year-old playlist that i just keep adding and adding and adding to and when i get into my techno mood my detroit techno mood i just go to that and put it on random or i'll put it on the apple one and look for new artists while i'm editing and i'll like skip oh, oh wow this is a new one this is a good groove add to the playlist yeah and it's interesting is like i'll find that if i listen to coarser techno um like nine nines or deborah deluca charlotte dewitt or you know i hate models the real industrial berlin stuff um my grades get my my edits get coarser and i start wanting higher contrast lower quality images and suddenly my edits turn into a look where it, i think it degrades them and they become cheaper so um the the more ambient usually the better um, that being said, I listen to a lot of house. I listen to a lot of Prague house. I listen to a lot of Stefan Baitzin, er, uh, Hernan Catanel. I'll listen to um, Carl Cox sometimes. He's not Prague house. He's more techno. Same with Adam Bayer. I'll listen to those guys. Um, you know, if it's a, if, if it's a less intense, um, underground style shoe, I'll also listen to Breakbeat because hell, I like the movie Snatch and Breakbeat's in that all over the place. I haven't heard the term Breakbeat in like 15 years. It's coming back. I was never a big fan of breakbeat, but that's uh, that's that's uh, teach their own. Yeah, so. I'll listen to jazz. Uh, Stan Getz has a wonderful playlist on Spotify. Um, but yeah, no, I, I find that a lot of the time the music does influence the edit and the space I have to get in. So I need I need a lot of stuff without lyrics to form the intention of where I want the photos to go. A lot of the parts of our brain that, uh, that use our senses are very close to one another, and so they're very tied. That's why I like taste and smell oftentimes will be married together. You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. We're going to shift gears to kind of the final section that I want to talk about, and that is deliverables. When you do a a shoot with a client, and I'll start with mine so you can react, of course. So when I do a shoot with a client... Um, if it's a creative collaboration with me and a model and there's no money exchanging hands, we're just working on portfolio work. What I typically do is I give the models two edits of the same shot. I'll give them what I call my web edit, where I will export for web. And they can, and I tell them like, this is the folder that your agency can access or a folder you can put on your website. Then I give them a second folder called IG for Instagram because as we all know, the Instagram algorithm sucks. And if they use the web shots and put them on Instagram, they usually don't render correctly. And also, as we discussed in our uh, Chase Light Not Algorithms episode, check that out in our earlier uh, discography, which is that uh, no camera shoot in 5x4 for the most part, unless you have an 8x10 large format. And uh, most cameras don't shoot in a one by one, even though a Hasselblad and a Mamiya C330 and some of the, the Raleigh stuff does. 99.9% .9 of the cameras out there don't shoot in either of those formats. It's a very specific format. However, it's the format that Instagram decided they were going to standardize. And so um, if somebody tries to take my native two by three shots that I take on my Canon R5 or my uh, three by four shots that I take on my GFX or my six by seven shots that I take on Mamma Mia six by seven. I tend to hand them cropped exactly the way I saw them in the camera. I mean, I may crop it in, but I'll still crop it in at the same aspect ratio because I want it to be the ratio that I experience things with. And if they take that and then they try to post it on Instagram, Instagram will like zoom in on it and automatically crop it. And then it'll upscale things and the pixels will get larger. And so I give them a second folder of the exact same edits where I give, I decide, I don't let them decide to go, this is a one by one, this is a five by four. Then I give them a little disclaimer like, hey, don't make horizontal shots, try to go with vertical shots. Don't try to mix a five by four with a one by one. They have to be the same. If you try to post it in a carousel, then it's going to fuck up the shots. 
So that's that's how I deliver stuff to a client. Unless it's a specific job where like they need print or they need something like that, a standard shoot, that is how I deliver um, my stuff to a client. How do you deliver your stuff, Brandon? I used to I used to delineate between web folders and Instagram folders, and honestly, I just I just don't give a fuck about that anymore. Um, I deliver. I have a little formula for exporting uh, web exports. I'll give so on the high res files upon request at, at all times. But uh, for right now, I basically, if I can, I crop down to four by five. Why? I know that it's not technically good because I shoot a photo in my camera the way that I want it to come out. Um, I just, I leave that crop and I just, that's how I shoot it. Um, but I also take, I also take different images. Um, so I'll shoot larger knowing that I'm going to crop. I'll zoom out knowing that I'm going to crop. Um, if I'm shooting a face and I like the way everything's fitting into the frame, I'll, I'll move the camera up a bit and leave space above the head and zoom out a bit so that I can crop in at a four by five because I, it, it pains me to say, but I know where this photo's going. <laughs> if I need to, if I need to pull up the raw file and, um, and change it to, to, to print or to go on my website so that it's a proper crop, I will do that. But 90% of my images are going on um, modeling pages and people's Instagrams and they're not being printed. So I shoot with the 4x5 in mind. For the most part, I send stuff out. Um, if I can crop it without it compromising hands or, or feet or stuff like that or just the overall balance of the image, I'll crop to a 1080 by 1350 and export at... 76% quality because that is the perfect Instagram ratio for posting. It compromises no sharpness. I also have a specific uh, sharpness formula so that when they do post it on Instagram, they are getting pixel for pixel the sharpest quality that they can possibly get. Um, and so I send them I send them all like that in a singular folder through Google Drive. And it usually, it usually works pretty well. It works great for carousels. And like I said, if they need the high res, it, I usually send it upon request. I too use uh, Google Drive. Now, when you export, do you export out of Lightroom or do you export out of Photoshop? Always Photoshop. Lightroom's export is atrocious. Yeah. See, I used to do the same thing. I would export out of uh, Photoshop. But then when I switched over to Capture One, Capture One has some uh, formulas for, for uh, Instagram that seem to work pretty well. But uh, maybe I should try yours out versus Capture One and see which one I like better as far as exporting. So that does it for today's episode. We were talking about our editing process. We could probably do several episodes on editing. I want to do an episode on like skin retouching and maybe have a skin retoucher in here. I know we keep talking about having guests in here, but we haven't actually got around to inviting them. We'll probably do that. Don't forget to check out uh, our link for Luminar Neo. Uh, we have a link in the description below where you can get 10% off. Follow us on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, what else are we on? Yes, we're on Twitter. Spotify. F11pod. Yes. Uh, and go to f11pod.com. And until next time, chase light, not algorithms. See you later, kids. Thank you for listening to today's episode. For more information about this podcast, go to www.f11pod.com.